So actually, you'll be doing something like this by the end of Summer Hydro with the uh, survey class. You'll be able to do most of this with your own chart. Uh, so don't feel like you're anywhere near having to be able to understand what's up on the screen. But this is just a summary video to sort of show you what, what you end up producing throughout the whole process of this semester and next semester and the Summer Hydro class, plus all the extra outside lectures that are involved with the training here. What you're looking at up here is the bag format is a raster, so kind of like a picture. It's got pix pixels and cells. Today we're going to talk about how to work with some of these files and we're going to see some of the many aspects in working with bags. They're a really neat format, but they have a lot of complexity to them in terms of different parts. Here's a bag from off of Portsmouth right near us. That's actually LiDAR data and you can see that there's data only along the shorelines. LiDAR data doesn't work very well with deep water. It, it's absorbed by the water column, so it doesn't make it down very far. And what I've got up here is parsing through multiple parts of all the data on NGDC with bags. Some of that is the bounding box taken out of the metadata files. There's a couple files that originally had bounding boxes in the wrong place. So we'll start seeing how to go in there read the metadata, check it out, read the gridded depth data, maybe do like a little histogram with it. And there's also a second layer called uncertainty that's tucked in there for each grid cell point. So with the uncertainty, you can see what is the uh, predicted quality of that data. Maybe quality is the wrong word, but uncertainty, you'll see certainty for each grid cell. And you can see how that varies over the surveys. What goes on here with bags is there's a number of different ways that NOAA slices up the bags for their particular process. And so that you'll end up with bags on top of each other. They'll be at different resolutions and different subregions within it, depth bands. The neat thing about bags is they actually started somewhere along that hallway over there. Shep Smith and Brian Calder and a few other people had the idea of when you get data from a survey and you have multiple pieces running around and they're in different files, it's really easy to lose part of it. And during my PhD thesis, I found lots of metadata files for data that looked really awesome. I would have loved to include that data in my thesis. I found the metadata, but I could never find the data files. The bummer about metadata is there's, everybody spends a lot of time focusing on phone numbers and email addresses and uh, physical addresses. And when data is 10 or 15 years old, that person may have switched jobs. That phone number might not even be for the same organization. And so it's really tough when these things are separated out. So the, one of the ideas of bags is to put everything in, the, in one file together. You either find it all or none of it. The trouble is, is that then inside of this container, which a lot of programs don't yet understand, there's all these different data types. So we have to be able to pull them apart, double check them. Now, a lot of the tools that you guys are gonna be using in a lot of your other classes do know about them, but it doesn't necessarily give you as much flexibility as you'd like. When you build a bag in Keras, you get to type in three or four fields, and then Keras does everything else behind the scenes and doesn't even show you the metadata file it generates. It just says, here's your bag. And by the way, good luck viewing this. Th that's not necessarily a big deal. It's just, you know, this is the first pass on generating bags from within Keras. So what we need to be able to do is create our own tools that go in and validate what's in those bags. Make sure that what's coming out of these you know, very expensive programs is what we want. So the idea I've had with the, it's behind this video is being able to preview every bag in a data set, pull out the metadata, do histograms of the data in there, and make sure that what's coming out of these tools is uh, what you expect. And now it's important to think too, when you're dealing with data, especially complicated stuff like multi-beam bathymetry and hydrography, that it's really important to have multiple tools look at the same data because there could be a bug in one or the other of your tools. And if you have three or four tools that can all read and validate that same data and you run them all and they all agree that that's good data, you have a much better chance of what you're producing and sending out being good. So I'm always gonna stress on you guys that when you collect and produce data, double check it, validate it, and validate it a couple different ways if you can. It's kind of a pain in the butt, to put it lightly, but being able to go in and double check the data on your own is fantastic. And we find all kinds of mistakes on our own data when we have the time and the energy to double check. You don't always get that, 
is a ISO format. Yeah. It's in the process of becoming an IHO S100X standard. It contains ISO standards. It contains the, and I don't remember the um, ISO number for the metadata format, but I don't think BAG itself is ISO standard. It's definitely open in the notes. In fact, class 18. So I've downloaded the uh, org file for today. That's a perfect question leading into the first little bit of the class. So Open NavSurf is a website and if you actually trace down where this is physically on the globe, it is about 50 feet that way. <laughs> so this is the website run by CECOM for the community. There's standards for it. There's background papers. There's Shep's thesis on here. And the code is all released under various open source licenses. So if you want to read all the C source code to the details of this, you can uh, go and do that. We're going to try and avoid the C and the library side of it and take a different route. We're going to look at it through some command line tools that know how to describe the basic format and from some Python. So at NGDC, which is the primary data archive for all geophysical data sets for NOAA and many other organizations, and probably rolling deck to repository or R to R is uh, working with these folks. The site sometimes can be a little bit difficult to navigate, and there's a lot of text-based and map-based interfaces. I wrote a little tool that just scraped the entire site using wget. It was kind of aggressive. I downloaded every single bag file on the website over a weekend. Probably shouldn't do that too often because that a little hard on the networks. Since I seem to always have a hard time finding that, inside of this org mode file, there's a link right to MGG is Marine Geology Geophysics, and I've linked straight into some example bags, and there's actually um, just a web server that you can go through, and it's organized by survey number. When you see an H in front of a survey, that's hydrographic survey, and then they have these numbers just keep increasing as they do more and more surveys. And we're gonna grab some of these examples and take a look at some of these bags using a couple different tools. Hopefully you guys have already gone and made a class 18 directory. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna grab two surveys. I'm just gonna use this, these two wgets here. Edit paste. We're gonna actually go, go all through it. So hopefully by the end of class today, you should have a pretty good sense of what a bag is, at least at a first pass. We'll see the gridded data and we'll actually see, if we get enough time, some pictures of the actual gridded data inside of matplotlib. There's lots and lots of grid formats, and this is just one of the you know, several hundred formats that are around. So let's take a peek at what we've got. We've got GZ compressed files. We all should hopefully remember how to uncompress a GZ file. So g unzip star.gz, and the files will get a lot bigger quick. Sit here and wait. We're gonna run the file command once these are done. Mine finished, so I'll do an ls-l. So ls-l, and you'll see that they end in .bag. And remember that those extensions are a convention and they could be named anything. So we'll run file star.bag. Here's the first thing we're gonna to have to cover today. It reports back that this is hierarchical data format or HDF. There are several different versions of this. And by this point, I'm hoping that you guys are comfortable with that, and it's fine. If you want me to go a little bit more like that, I will quick do the same thing, make dir bag. Do I call it bag or bags? Bag. Bags. So we'll do file star.bags. The HDF file format is a container not too unlike things like zip and tar. You can put a whole bunch of different things in there, and there's all sorts of software to try and work with these. Uh, unlike zip and tar, it's designed to be directly accessing the data. It's meant for scientific data, various formats. There's lots and lots of formats like this. They're very similar, but they, you have to use different tools for them. So unfortunately, there's things like NetCDF, which is used in a program called Generic Mapping Tools, or GMT. And it's very similar to this, but you have to use different software libraries and command line tools, unfortunately, to read them. So we're gonna walk through a little bit of taking a look at this. 
Like before, we, last time, I've got some notes about running the MD5 sum and the SHA256, and you can see if they've been updated since. It's actually, uh, I've archived NOAA's data from May of 2010, and I've seen that a lot of the files have changed since then. Some have changed file names, some have changed content without the file name changing, without an indication from the file that they've changed other than the checksum. Watch out for that. In this case, if the checksum's changed, as long as your file's working, it's okay. We're not really too worried about which version of the file we're using, although we're gonna actually go and download one of the old files in a little bit and look at the details of it, since there's some uh, interesting mistakes that were, were done in there that I hope will help you guys get a feel for what's good metadata and what's bad metadata. So when we're looking at metadata, one of the things I'd like you guys to be thinking about is what's helpful. Metadata, when you're producing it, it's hard to think about you know, what someone else who might be consuming your data is going to need. But here, we're the consumers of bags today, and that metadata is there to help us work with that data. So if there's problems with it, those are things to remember for later on when you're producing a bag in the spring. Think about that when you're producing the bag. What in here was helpful or not helpful to you in terms of the content of the bag? It's hard to understand what's helpful in metadata. I've had people get upset when I didn't include a phone number in the, uh, in the bag, but the author doesn't necessarily have a phone number. You know, if the person has changed jobs or is retired, their office phone isn't useful anymore. So try to remember those kinds of things and think about those and ask questions if you see stuff in the metadata that you're curious about. We're gonna go over to so I want you guys to skip a bunch of notes and see if you can skim down to the nope. And if you remember in Emacs, you can do a control S and type N-O-P-E and you will get to where I am in the notes. So this is a little reminder of our little Emacs trick of the day. We'll have a couple more later on, but this is a uh, control S is good. And we're gonna grab two bags. And if you look at this web address, we're no longer looking at NGDC, we're looking at my web page and it's under research tools, examples, old dash bags. So copy those two lines. So we can do like control A, control space, move down two lines, and meta W. And if we paste those two in, these files should come down really fast because they're just coming down from upstairs. And I've compressed these with BZ2 because they compress better that way. So we'll do a B unzip two, star.bag.bz2. Do an ls-l. And you should now see some funny file names. So one of the things to think about when you build data files, these are the old files coming from, that's the wrong date, but they come from 2010. These were named H11703, so that's the survey number, underscore combined, underscore 5M. This one was H11703 underscore office. I'm not sure what office was supposed to mean. Underscore 5M dot bag. When they first started using bags, they hadn't really come up with a good naming scheme for them and written it down. So the names kind of wandered all over the place and people tried out things. It's very confusing in the long run when you have naming schemes that wander. So they've now come up with a new naming scheme that's based on a couple of different things. You'll see that some of them have stuck around, like they still have a combined, but now they say they have an MB for multi-beam. This is the cell size, 8M, and they have a units in there for meters. They also have units there. They also have the vertical datum in there. Here, this says one of four, so you know there's gonna be three others if you actually wanna process all of that. So this is a good lesson in file naming conventions are not necessarily critical, you don't have to have them, but they really help a lot. So if you get a whole ton of data and the files are really consistently named, it makes life a lot easier. But we're gonna go work with these two files, which are older and have some quirks that are good illustrations of things. Bag specification, there are no uh, rules for the naming of the bag? The bag specification doesn't say anything about the naming. And in fact, I'm not sure it even says dot .bag. All right, so let's start off with some programs that might know something about that. We've used GDAL a bunch of times, and let's see if GDAL actually knows anything about this. It's often important to know which version of something you're running. So if you do GDAL info dash dash version, we're gonna see that we have GDAL 1.6.3 released in 2009, which is a little while ago, since we're now in 2011. So we're looking at a release from two years ago. Maybe it's got support, maybe it doesn't. 
So we can say gdal info h11 and we'll do office because I think the office name is just kind of kooky and weird and fun. And if you hit enter after doing that, so here's the command. GDAL is going to try and do its best. So it actually has HDF support. So it's running off an HDF5 driver, but we don't see any indication. It doesn't say bag or anything like that. So it's a little questionable. And as we look down in here, it's saying the, fi the file size is 512 by 512. Coordinate system is and it doesn't know the coordinate system. That's a bad sign. So under metadata, it actually says bag root, bag version 1.0.0. That looks pretty good. And it's got some information about some subsets. But then when you get down to the coordinates, those coordinates are probably not anything real on the Earth. They go from 0, 0. And anytime you see 0, 0, which is if it's geographic as a point off of Africa where a lot of data seems to lie, <laughs> This data doesn't look good. Just guessing by that, I would say that we have failed to be able to read it with this version of GDAL. If you guys run this command here, so this is gonna be, if we ask GDAL which formats it knows about, we can say GDAL info dash dash formats. If we hit enter, we get way too much stuff. So we're gonna use the vertical bar for a pipe. We're gonna pipe it to egrep dash I says case insensitive. So if you see me do egrep, I do this all the time. This is sort of like my staple find some text. I haven't showed you an or before, but we can search for some text or some other text inside. Unfortunately, it's going to reuse the vertical bar. So I'm sorry, that's a little confusing. So if we say BAG or HDF, so this is going to say search for the, the letters BAG or the letters HDF. So you're going to type in this right here and then hit enter. And this is going to tell you all the text that has HDF or bag in it, lowercase or uppercase or any combination of. And we can see that it supports HDF version 4, HDF version 4 image. I'm not sure what the difference is. HDF 5, HDF 5 image. And there's no hint of the word bag anywhere in there. So this version of GDAL doesn't cover bags. You guys don't have access to this. But hopefully in newer versions of Ubuntu, you'll get a newer version of GDAL. And so here, this is me running it on, a, on my laptop. And GDAL is 1.8 released in 2011, July. And this one, when I ran that egrep command, so you guys don't worry about running this again because this, this is a different machine. It actually showed up with BAG, bathymetry attributed grid. So this one actually knows about bags and can tell you more about them. Unfortunately, on our virtual machine with the Ubuntu version that we have, we don't have that support. So we're going to have to not worry about GDAL for this format and try and do other things. Is it RO? Good question. So if you look in the parentheses here, the question was, what is the RO in here? This is read only. Some of the formats it can read, some of the formats it can write, and some it can read and write. So this means it can only read these formats. It can't create. This tool does not know how to create a bag. And this is because uh, no one uh, wrote the code? Or... Correct. No one's written the code to write out a bag from this. And in fact, it's probably a bad idea for this tool to be able to write bags because it's not using the bag library that comes from the standard. It has its own code to read bags. And so the chances of it writing a correct bag would be small unless we put in the code from the main library and that's kind of, it clashes with some of the stuff inside of that, this, this tool. So. so now you guys get to become system administrators again. We're going to switch to using the HDF5 tools and we're going to go take a look at the raw data. I'm a big, big proponent. You're going to hear me again and again talk about getting at the raw bits and bytes with the lowest level that you can with data that you're using so that you trust it better when you're using higher level tools and know what you're getting into. So run a sudo space apt dash get space install space hdf5 dash tools. And if you don't remember the research tools password for when, when you use sudo to do root like super user stuff, it's bang rt 2011 vm. And this is the part I love about Ubuntu where you can install software and it goes pretty quickly. So let's go ahead and try them out. The first one we're going to use is, I'm going to type clear to clear the screen, just to give myself some more space. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. H5LS. And remember that we can type MAN for a manual page. 
And if you want to speed read, you're welcome to. What this does is it says it prints information about a file or data set. Not very helpful. We're going to work through this command and see if we can take a look at a bag. And we can see we're, we haven't looked at the spec for bags, and we're not really going to go read that because I don't really want to go read a big journal paper about it. So we'll do H5 LS and then H11703 office underscore five dot bag. Remember, your tab is your friend for completion. And hit enter and see what you get. When you're looking for like, stuff like this H5LS, are you are just like searching? Like, how do you find stuff like that? That is an awesome question. How did I find all these HDF tools? So the thing I did is I didn't know what bags were when I started. So I downloaded a bunch. I ran file. It wrote back hierarchical data format. And I went and found there's uh, an HDF library called uh, uh, HDF5. And then I started running things like apt cache search HDF, which is probably going to return a lot of stuff to see what was available. And there's you know a few things, and I tried a couple. I had about four or five tools I tried first that didn't work. That were either too old and crusty or too hard to figure out. And you know, googling for HDF5 came up with a few things. There's websites like Stack Exchange or Stack Overflow, where you can post questions saying, I'm trying to work with HDF5 and I'm not getting it help. I'm trying to do X. This took me a week to get to the point that I'm showing you today. So my hope is that by you guys seeing enough of these examples, as you, you're probably going to work with bags, you're probably going to work with some of the other formats, you can skip that week that I had to spend just stumbling around in the dark. But if you get to a new format that you don't know, that's being brought into a project, for example, that we haven't covered, you're gonna to have to go through that same discovery process that isn't necessarily easy. My hope is that this class is the beginnings of a document that's organic and grows and starts having more of this. You know, When I get X, where do I start? And we can't get you all the way through to understanding the format totally, but this is a kickstart for bags to get you guys going in the right direction. And as we hit other formats, we'll keep doing that. <coughs> And hopefully over the years, we're going to keep growing this so that we have a master document that you guys can get back at that's got these formats. If you have a format that you really, really, really want to see before the end of the semester, you can email me and I might get to it. I'll try. It depends. Sometimes some formats are too complicated to get through or it might take me a month or two to really understand the, the quirkiness of them. So I can't promise anything. So let's keep digging through H5LS and see what we can figure out. We're not going to go back to the man page. I'm just going to show you some of the stuff I found in the man page. So we can do an H5 LS. That first one just gave us bag root and group. And I have to tell you that when I saw that, it didn't really mean anything to me. Found there's a recursive. Now, since you're, most of you have never taken a computer science class, you might not know what recursive means. But recursion is sort of, if there's a tree of things, we have kind of a root and you've got nodes below it and some other stuff down below. If this is a sort of a hierarchy of things, recursion is basically walking down this tree and walking over each of these nodes and going over it. If you see like directory things or change permissions with chmod to make something executable, it has a dash r for recursive that will go then down into the tree. So we're gonna go ahead and run that and we get a little bit more. So now we're starting to get something that looks like we might care about it because bag root and group, ugh. but inside of bag root, we actually see there's elevation, metadata, tracking list, uncertainty. Those look like things we're gonna care about with uh, hydrographic survey data. Now I don't know what the tracking list is and I've never actually looked in there. If you guys get curious, you can figure that one out and let me know, that would be really cool. But we're gonna look at the metadata, which is actually ISO XML metadata that describes what's in here. Elevation is a grid, a regular grid of the elevations. So it looks like a picture of the seafloor. And uncertainty is how well we know each of those positions inside the elevation. So we're going to go ahead and try and dig into this stuff a little bit more. This look like a matrix, no? Elevation and uncertainty are the same. A matrix is an excellent way of thinking about this, yes. But uh, the other type? I believe that's the sot. I'm not totally sure what these parameters here are on the right. I believe this is the width and the height of the cells. But the metadata is? This might be the number of lines. It's not really a gridded format. This is a 
strings. And we're going to see that this is very confusing. It's not a fun format with this tool. So it's, it doesn't really understand strings very well. I'll show you how I read it, but it's painful how I read it. Then we'll do it with Python later on. It'll be a lot easier. What we're going to do now is we're going to try and get at that metadata. It's going to tell us what this is about. It's always good to sort of start off with a readme or a metadata file if you can find one. So what we're going to do is we're going to use, so we're going to do a dash D. Why don't we just do a man page on it? We'll say man, you guys don't, don't have to start man, we'll just put it up on the screen. Man H5LS and we're going to look for slash D, print the values of the data set. <coughs> so we're going to print the metadata and see what it does. So we'll say H5LS dash D, the file name. And after lots of Googling and struggling, I figured out that you can paste the path to what you're looking for right on like it's a file name, which is both cool and weird. Copy paste. So we've tacked on. So here's our file name. And then here's the path with inside of the HDF5 data. And we're going to hit enter. And that's really gross. You know what, rather than scrolling back, I'm going to rerun that with pipe to head. And we'll take a peek at this. So here's the command we ran. If you can read past all these quotes, you're pretty talented. So it's left angle bracket question XML. So this is a format we actually care a lot about. We're going to learn about throughout the semester. XML is a really useful way to store data. This is not a very useful way to display XML <laughs> with quotes around every single character. And it looks like this is a character position. So I think we have 18 characters up to here. That's just miserable. And I actually spent hours yeah. trying to figure out how to ask this thing to please not do that and just tell me what it's in there because it's text. I still have open questions out there on the internet hoping someone will tell me because I can't figure it out. So let's go ahead and write a command that will turn that goo into something we care about. It's going to be a long command here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get rid of these first two lines, the metadata and the data. I'm going to use that same grep command. Grep is like my hammer that I attack everything with. And we're going to basically say we want to find every line that has a quote in it. So all this horrible stuff, it's kind of helpful actually, because we can ask for every line that has a quote. So we can say grep, I should have written egrep, doesn't matter. So I'm going to search for, and I have to protect it with single quotes, the double quote character. And then we'll pipe that to head again to see what we get as we build up our command. Here's the command. And if I scroll back just a little bit so you can see the last one, we were trying to get rid of those two lines and they're not here anymore. So that got rid of those first two lines by trying to return the lines that just that have quotes in them. So now we've got to face off with the quotes because they suck. So we're going to say cut. Now I have to back up because I want each of these characters on a single line. If we pipe that to head again and there's another option, two options we're going to have to add here. One is dash dash string and the other is dash dash simple. Simple says put all of these guys, each character on its own line. So if we hit enter, we get rid of this line number and we put each one on its own line. So we added those two guys right there. You can see this is already not being very fun. It's pretty convoluted, but we're actually getting close. So what we can do now is we can use our old friend cut and we can cut on the field delimiter equals and we can grab that middle section of text. So if we say cut dash D and now things get funky because we're trying to use things like equal signs that have special meanings to the shell. If you put a backslash in front of a character, it prevents it from acting like an actual quote to quote a string. So we'll put a backslash quote. This is getting into some kind of advanced shell scripting stuff. And we can say dash F and can anybody think which field we want without sneaking a peek down below? If we're cutting on a delimiter of the quote, it's kind of like a comma separated value file, but we're using quotes as a really bizarre separator. This is field one, this is field two, and this is field three. So we want to grab field two. I'm trying to convince you that this tool is no fun. And if we type head, we now see that we're just seeing, and you can actually get closer to being able to just read XML. And if all text was like this from files, we'd all go nuts. 
And we have a one last problem, is we don't want all of this on different lines. We want to collapse them together. We can use a command called tr or translate to translate that new line character into nothing. It's kind of a weird option. Usually you're translating from one character to another, like you're changing commas to tabs or you know, something like that for a CSV to a tabs element of file. But we can do tr, and if you give it dash d, which is run off my screen, this is when long command lines start to get really annoying. So we're going to be doing this guy right here. So we'll do dash d. Remember that backslash character protects things? It also has special meaning sometimes. So slash n is the new line character. We're going to pipe that to less rather than head because we're going to get a lot of text on one line. So we'll type less. I'll let you guys go ahead and type that in and press return when you're ready. And hopefully you'll see some text that looks a little more readable. It won't be very fun though. All right, go. Tell me what's in this file. No, that sucks. You know, if, you, if you're used to reading it, you can start seeing things like there's a date in here and it was collected in 2008, May, but this isn't the greatest, we can do better. So let's save that to a file. So if we do greater than rather than a pipe, so we're gonna send it to a file. We're gonna call it the same file name, but with, uh, it'll look like this file name. So I'll just do an edit, copy, edit, paste. So it's just the same thing as our, so here's our input file, and we've changed the dot bag into a dot XML. So we'll hit enter. Now do an ls-l, and we have a new file right there. There's some XML, and I'm gonna send you guys back to Emacs school. So we'll say Emacs client dash dash no dash wait. So we're gonna tell Emacs, please edit this file for us. H 117 tab, office tab, XML. So when you hit enter on this, Emacs should pop up with that XML file. So go ahead and hit enter on that. I'll leave it up for a second as you guys catch up. And at least with Emacs, it's colored a little bit. So some of the keywords are uh, at least highlighted. So you get blue and red to go with your black. <laughs> and we get a blank screen. Awesome. Uh, do an ls-l and take a quick look in your directory. See how you have a zero length file? That one? Yeah, so that's your XML. You might want to make this terminal just a little bit wider. If you look up here in your command, yeah. I see a vertical bar and a, a uh, greater than. Yeah. That basically that sucks the data into nothing. And then, so hit up arrow twice and one more time and delete that vertical bar, that last pipe. One of those things where typing accuracy and Lots of random, it almost looks like a random character generation here. If you leave like, for example, a vertical bar right in here from before when you had it here, that's a common way to get in trouble. I'll go ahead and run that command and you should see something like that. You can control C that, it seems unhappy. Um, down here your Emacs is confused. Mm -hmm. So it wanted to, it's asking you, it's already loaded the file, it says do you want to reload it? So go down here and type yes. So click on this window, you click right in there. See there, it's asking you, yeah. and just type yes. So now we're staring at stuff that kind of runs together, and I'm gonna start bringing XML out of the, the like hideous fog that is here. In XML, it's a format that has tags around data. So if you have a field like date, the way you store a date in XML is you put angle brackets around, this is called a tag, and then you might have 2008-05-11. So this says 2008, May 11. And then you end your tags, and I'm going to forget which way the slash goes. Slash goes this way. If your Emacs is telling you that this XML is not valid, that's totally true. This XML is very not valid. It's got all kinds of problems. Document, OK. Um, I would expect that you probably have a bad file with nothing in it. So if you go back here, and if you do an ls-l, what I would do is bring this up so we can see the bottom. Do meta x, alt x, revert dash buffer, press enter, type yes. Uh, you're just gonna have to follow along. I'm not sure why yours is being so amazingly picky. 
We're going to come back and read it the right way with Python in a minute. All of the data is going to be hiding between these tags, and there's software that's designed to parse this for you. So when we get to Python, this is going to get easier because there's special tools meant explicitly for this. So you can just ask for, give me the date, and it will then go find it for you. But we're going to use Emacs a little bit, and this is a common thing that I do with really badly formatted data. So I wanted to have you guys see that at least once of how you might take something that looks as terrible as this and turn it into something useful. So if we look at one of these tags, we'll just pick random one in here. In this block of text, this is the slash saying this is the end of the westbound longitude, and this is the beginning of eastbound longitude. Every time two tags butt up against each other, there's a greater than, less than. If we take that text and split and put a new line in there between every single one of those throughout the file, it's going to take each tag and put it on one line. And as you get used to working with files like this, you'll see patterns like that, where if you replace something, you can take something that's all run together and figure out where to shove in new lines. It might actually look a lot cleaner. So let's give that a go. And there's uh, instructions right in the lecture notes how to do that. So I'm going to do meta less than to go to the top of the file. And I'm going to do meta x replace string. And I'm going to hit enter. And now I'm going to replace one string with another string. So we're going to take greater than, less than, and we're going to replace that with greater than, control G. So what you've got is you've got your region selected here. So you need to do a meta less than, or you can click on the beginning of the file. So when you hit that less than, make sure you're holding down the shift key at the same time. So shift, meta, and then the comma or less than. So going back to the beginning of a file is meta less than. This is the beginning of a file. And meta greater than goes to the end of the file. So we'll keep using those. Now I'm going to also show you something else that's really kind of crazy, but really helpful. If we want to insert an enter key, it's kind of hard typically to put an enter key in there. So we have to do CQ is a very special command in Emacs that says the next key I hit, put it in the literal thing that it is. It's kind of crazy. If you do the down arrow key, that's the same as control J. Those are aliases for each other. So control J is down or kind of like enter. If you do a CJ, that's going to put into our replacement string a new line character. So we do a control Q, control J, and you don't see anything appear in there other than we've now scooted down from here over to here showing that we're, we're adding a new line. So I recommend after you've, we've gone through the class today, try it again on your own. Try replacing a few things. Just take a, a dummy file like this and just replace a bunch of stuff and see how it goes. It takes practice to get used to replacing these things. And then I'm going to do a greater than, sorry, a less than. This is pretty heavy duty Emacs here, but once you get used to this, if you're comfortable with replacements, you can take files that are completely messed up, are not in the form that you want, and in a few keystrokes, rearrange them the way you want. So I'm going to hit enter. And if you're totally messed up and confused, we're going to reset in a minute or two. So you can just then ignore all this and move on. So we've now hit enter. And we have something that looks a little bit more like what we want. I'm going to hit meta less than to go back up to the top. And now it looks a little more friendly. We have something where it actually has one line that says date. There's a date in there and then end date. So it's right in the notes. So right here, this is how I wrote out that command. Meta x replace dash string, a greater than character, a less than character. This is, this is not me typing a space. I press the return key. I did a greater than, control Q, control J, and then a less than. And then to run the command, you're going to press enter. Yeah? Can I just write the ASCII character for the type of key? No. It's trying to, it, it's in a funky mode where it's trying to interpret things. If you try to type an ASCII character for a return in there, it's going to get confused. Before, what's the ammo? I make for this the first one. Select this. Yes, yes. Copy and after. Yes, that's a, that is an excellent way of doing it. So Giuseppe had a good point that if you're somewhere like this, you can do one of them. So I'm going to undo that. If we take one of them and we put, we hit enter right here and we copy this. So if I highlight that region, meta w, or edit copy, now we can do meta x replace 
string, and I can then type greater than, less than, press enter, and then I can do a control Y to paste, or I could do edit control G. We'll start over here. So meta W, copy that, and then we'll do meta X, replace string, greater than, less than, enter, and then I'm gonna yank control Y, and then hit enter, and then we'll do the same thing. So I'm gonna show you one last command, and then we're gonna go away from Emacs so you guys can take a little break from the Emacs craziness. Do uh, meta less than? Yep, now do meta x, and then replace dash string, enter. Then do your greater than, less than, enter. And then do greater than, control Q, control J, and then less than, press enter. There you go. So if you haven't got it at this point, go ahead and just watch what we're gonna do and try it out later on. Take your time when we're not in class. We're gonna do one more crazy command. This is a command I love Emacs for. Go meta less than, get yourself at the very top of that file. Press control space to start marking a region. So it says mark activated. Use that end of file command right here. and say meta greater than. So now I've selected the entire file and I'm gonna type meta x indent dash region. Press enter and it's going to indent all of this XML so that it has a little more visual meaning to it. So every time there's a tag inside of a tag, it's gonna indent a little bit. So it looks more a little bit like programming source code. So I'm gonna hit enter and go back up to the top. So meta less than, and we are now staring at somewhat better formatted XML that is actually kind of messed up. It's got some problems that, I don't know how we pulled it out, but you can at least start seeing that this is your first view of overly complicated XML. So inside here we have responsible party, and inside of there they've got some other weird responsible party, and then individual name. Here we have an individual that's named Chief Pacific Hydrographic Branch, so I'd like to meet that person. Um, organizational name, NOAA, and there's these weird percent twenties running around that we're just gonna ignore. So that's part of the problem, that this is not really valid data. Position name, yes? Is a space. I believe that's a, yes, probably. There's also a quote, uh, maybe it's a quote, because I'm pretty sure that's a quote up there. Yeah, we're not gonna worry about it too much. The whole point of this is not that we have great data, it's that we can read it a little bit. So it looks a little bit more related, and you can start seeing things like title. Hey, this is great, you know, the data set has a title, but, our title is bag file created from n colon pro322 surveys h11703 Keras field sheet office blah 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 blah. That's probably not the title that you wanted for your survey. Oh, and it says office final HNS. If you put that on a map and gave it to say Andy Armstrong as the title of your map, he might be a little frustrated with you. There's some troubles in here that, I'm, I don't know if Keras has fixed this yet, hopefully it's on their bug list. There's no way to enter in the title, so it took just the path to the file that you use to build the bag as the title. And some of them are like, not for release slash temp slash working directory slash blah blah blah. So this is my first, oh my goodness, these files aren't really what I want, but maybe there's a way we can work through it. And the abstracts down here talks about that there's a surveyed by Fugro, Pelagos, and you can start getting some information about the survey. If you look at the date part within that abstract, it says date of survey in the middle, and then it says 2009-01-2007. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, so there's lots of troubles with bags. Bags are, are fairly new, and we're still working through the quirks. So one of the things we're going to do in this class, hopefully, is I'm going to unpack all these metadata files from a giant blob of... Uh, Things and you're going to create a little bit of stuff and I'm going to do the work of grabbing them all for you so you don't all, if we all downloaded several terabytes of data from NOAA to here, we just kill the network for no good reason. So with this, don't worry about this anymore. If you're in the middle of something, you can just press control G and you can hide that, go to buffers and go back to your org file and just put this away. I know it's a little painful, but it's good to see a few times 
grinding through the data, we're going to go off and go to Python because Python is much friendlier for this kind of stuff. If you're really comfortable with Emacs, that's not bad, but we started off with a source of data that just stank, a badly formatted file that we had to do weird quote removals, and that's just a recipe for disaster. Now we get to do system administration again in a minute. So now we should be on bags from Python. If you can't find it, you can always go up to the top, do control S. So I did a control S search and we're going to type BAGS from Python. So we need to install a tool called python-h5py. And this is a module that is designed to read HDF5 inside of Python. So with Python, we have a little more control over what's going on. I think I've already installed it, but I'm going to be safe and paste that in there. So edit paste. So for me, it was already installed, so there was zero to install. So if you run a second time, it doesn't hurt anything. And now go ahead. I'm going to do a clear. You don't have to. And just type IPython. We're going to go back into the world of Python. And we're going to use this H5Py module to read the bag. And it should be easier to see what's going on. And we can plot some stuff. So I'm a big fan of being able to just plot the data and see what we've got in there. Because if the plot doesn't look right, then you know you're kind of on the wrong track. Um. We're, you don't need the dash dash pylab. Being within the class 18 directory and then installing it, where does it install that? When you, do the when you install apt software through apt-get, it's going to install it into the operating system as a whole. So the path that you're in doesn't matter. There's other ways to install Python that are going to drop things all over the place and leave you with a confused mess or hopefully an organized mess that someone else won't know but you might know. This way, it's a part of the operating system, and if you use the regular Python, it's just right there. And the notes are missing this. So you have to say import h5py to get the module. So press enter. And now we're going to go ahead and use h5py to load up our bag file and start playing with hdf5. And I hope this isn't necessarily easy, but it should be less confusing than the command line stuff. So we'll do h5py period. And remember that we can press tab, and you'll see all the commands that are in there. Don't expect that to be super easy, but at least you can read through them and see what's going on. We're actually going to use h5py.file. If you were just getting going on this and you weren't in this class, you'd have to go read the instructions or find a tutorial on this. h5py.file, single quote, capital H, press tab, and it's going to show you the files that are in that directory. So we want another one, and then we'll do office bag. So this is the command you're going to want to run for your second command. Remember, I've been typing tab up above. If you press enter, you created a, an object, but you didn't actually stick it in a variable. So we want to actually save it someplace. So I'm going to save that into a variable called bag. So go ahead and hit enter on this and load up that bag file. You can try playing it with it. Use type. Okay, I'm going to hit enter here. So this is going to save that to a variable called bag. We can type whose if you, or, and it will tell us what's in our environment. So here's our bag. So we can type bag period hit tab and see what a bag will do for us. There's a couple of functions on this that will tell us what's in there. I had to go digging through to find them. There's values. So go ahead and try that. Uh, I didn't find this one terribly exciting. And we also had items, maybe a little bit more helpful, not terribly. But what we can do is, so this is a, a hierarchical tree of things. It's not thankfully too deep, but we've got slash and then bag. So this is one thing, this is the next thing, bag root. Underneath bag root is a bunch of stuff and we want to go see what's down under there. So it kind of works like an array or a dictionary that we've seen before. So we can say root equals bag, use the square brackets and say slash bag root. So here we saw it contains a slash bag root. So if we do that, we now have this root object that is right here. So this is our root variable. So we don't have to worry about up here anymore. You can sort of 
ignore that. And we can say root dot items. And it gets much more interesting. So we step down a level and underneath here we have elevation and then metadata followed by tracking list. This is the one that I have yet to look into. And then uncertainty. So we can go ahead and grab the data out of these and hopefully H5Pi will give us a much nicer interface to our string. The HDF file is for the HDF file or for the bag file? It's for HDF5. So it doesn't necessarily know anything specifically about bags. But on the command line, the tools tend to be a little bit clunky. When you're in Python, they expect you to be digging into the data much more. And especially with Python having all these built-in functions for podding and whatnot, here it's going to give us things that we can actually work with. So let's go ahead and grab the metadata out. So if we say metadata equals bag bag root slash metadata, this should give us the metadata. It didn't complain. That's nice. If we say type metadata, we get that it's a H5Pi high level data set. I'm not really sure what that means, but it doesn't sound too bad. And if we say metadata sub zero, since we think this is a list of things, we get back the first character that we expect, that less than. We say dot value. We actually get that this turns into an array and we can see the beginnings of our XML. So you kind of have to read into things and know what to expect. Unfortunately, I knew that it, I'm looking for an XML document and so I start seeing uh, less than in the, the beginning of an XML header. In Python, we had a join command that took individual things and glued them together as strings. So we have an array of all these letters. So what we can say is our metadata underscore text equals, and one of the things I love about join is you can join on an empty string and it will stick everything right up against each other. So I'm gonna do a join and metadata dot value. Press enter. Nothing happened, but hopefully if we type metadata text, and since I know this is a string, I'm just gonna grab the first 100 characters out of it, doing like a little array slice thing, press enter, and we actually see that we have the beginnings of our XML metadata that we had before. Don't worry right now about the details of metadata too much. We'll get in there and we'll spend a lot of time with metadata. But you know what, I'd actually like to rather see a plot than stare at metadata all day. So let's go ahead and see if we can try to plot out some of the data, something real. Let's go and see if we can deal with the elevation because that's gonna be a grid that we can make a picture of. So we'll say elevation equals bag. We'll do the same weird address lookup thing, bag underscore root slash elevation. It's trying to make us think that this is like paths on a file system and I'm gonna cheat and grab just the, the values right away. And let's try type elevation. Surprise, surprise, we get back a NumPy array. That's kind of cool. So we now have an array of data that we can work with and they're trying to make it easy for us. So we can ask how, what the shape of that is. So we can say elevation shape. And the shape of this array is actually a grid or a matrix of 1400 by 2000 cells. Why don't we just try and plot it after we do a min and a max just to see what we've got in there. So we'll say elevation min. Okay, I think it's probably meters. I seem to remember seeing an M hiding in there that I didn't show you guys. Max. Okay, that's, that's not very nice. It's a pretty big elevation, but let's just plot it and see what happens. So we can say from matplotlib import pi plot. Now we didn't do dash dash pi lab, so we have to bring in pi plot, which is where all of our plotting stuff is hiding. So we can say dot plot elevation. And we're gonna hope this works. This is a like, you know, Hail Mary, give it a go. What's gonna happen? It might take a little bit of time because this is kind of a big array of stuff. If there's a lot of points, it's uh, 1400 times 2000 cells. 
and we're hoping a plot will show up sometime soon. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's working hard. Nope. We are. We have to type show for the first time. Thank you. So we'll say pi plot dot show. Press enter. Now it is working hard. That doesn't look too good to me. That's, that's probably not a bag. Or at least it's not how a bag should look. What we've got here is we've got a little bit of trouble in that we need to rearrange this to make it usable for this uh, code. Or we need to find the right program that plots this like an image. And there's actually something very specifically designed for that. So pyplot.im standing for image show and elevation. Press enter and hopefully on your screen will be something that looks vaguely like it might be useful. Not horribly useful, but getting there. The trouble is, is that that really large number in the max, so if we go back to our maximum value of 1 million, when it doesn't have any data in the cell, it writes 1 million as the uh, elevation in that cell. And so it's trying to plot an image with a really wide contrast range, and it's taking all that data that's right down near zero, it's getting collapsed down into blue. So we need to do something to improve that. So I have this little section here where I say, can we make this plot more useful? And what we want to do is replace in that array all of those big values with something called NAN. Anybody know what NAN stands for? Not a number. Not a number, yep. And matplotlib understands not a number and it won't try to do anything with it. Whereas when it sees a million, it says, okay, I got a really big number, I'll show it to you. So we're going to write some crazy code here that tries to go through our array and replace all those big numbers with a NAN. So I'm going to walk you guys through it and it's going to bring in bits and pieces of stuff we've done before. And when you start working with grids, you end up doing things like this all the time. Basically it's walk the whole cell, every cell in the grid, and do something to each point in the cell, each cell in there. So we'll say for x in range elevation. Now Keep that up there. Don't do what I'm going to do. I'm just going to show you something real quick. So we had elevation dot shape, and that's our x and our y widths and our heights. So we're going to use those two things in there for elevation dot shape. Just a second. That are we going to use numpy in this particular one? Yes. Thank you. All right. Control C. Keyboard interrupt. Thanks. Import numpy. So this is going to get us our numpy.nan, which is a floating point number, which when prints just prints out NAN. Doesn't have very good help. So go back and we'll start over with this now that we have our NAN available. And we're going to grab that first shape value, which is going to be our width. So this is going to count from 0 to 1 less than our width. So we're going to loop over all the x's. And then for each x, we're going to go through all the y's for y in range elevation dot shape and our height colon. And in NumPy, they have some nice uh, functionality to access cells. You can just put square brackets and you can say x comma y. So we'll say if, if elevation x comma y. Now, I don't really know the range of the data. So we, in the notes, I, I just know that anything that's positive is not in the water column. So we're going to get rid of anything that's above zero. If it's up in the sky or above ground, we, d we don't want it. So we'll say greater than zero colon. If it's greater than that, we're going to set that value to be NAN. So we'll say elevation sub x comma y equals numpy dot NAN. Now there's lots of potential here for typos. So type it carefully, press enter times till it's done, and go get a coffee. I don't think this is the best way to do this. There's probably ways that are way more efficient to loop over a whole array, but this is obvious, or at least hopefully more obvious than a magical do everything command. And uh, you can kind of work with it and try to build things as you go. So now we have a new thing with that. So we can go back to our plot command. We can go plot pyplot.image show elevation. And I kind of suggest before you hit enter, killing this figure, press enter. And it takes a little bit of time. And that looks more like bathymetry to me. So we've gotten rid of all of those values that were really big and turned them into NANs. 
matplotlib then ignores them and says, I'm not going to worry about those in my image contrast. And we now have something that looks like a little basin in here with some deep spots. There is some comment to say, OK, a block, uh, this value is uh, not a number. Probably. I'm just taking you slowly through this. And I, I'm a GNU plot user, so I haven't done a lot of this stuff too much before. So I haven't gone into all the details of everything that's possible. You could probably spend the next two years getting better at matplotlib and still have a lot left. With this command, remember that you can always do question mark, and you can go read up on it. And we can see if there's something like that. You can set your C map as color map. Uh, I'm not sure what norm what these guys are. Uh, I believe this is the transparent color, or alpha. And there may be something in here, if we go down through it, that says how to do something like that. And I'll let you read up on all the details. There's a lot. The best thing with matplotlib usually, if you're looking for something specific like that, is to go through the gallery and see if you can find an example of doing something like that where they need to like make a color, go, a range of things go away or a particular value go away. And they might have a really nice example written up for you. I'm going to stop here and we'll continue next time. And we'll do some histogramming. We'll plot up the uncertainty. And we'll start digging into that metadata and see what the metadata says that's it's either good or bad. Uh, metadata and XML, and you guys are seeing those for the first time. So I expect you will be overwhelmed. But just keep following through it, and hopefully with a bunch of examples over time, it'll start becoming more and more comfortable. And you'll get used to reading lots and lots of angle brackets. These guys, they love this character with date. So we're going to see lots and lots of stuff in angle brackets. And after a few hours of it, it'll get a little bit better. It never gets super easy. but.